So just lately I've been playing with this. The FlashPath floppy disk adapter from 1998. It's a cool little device that allowed a PC or a Mac with any old bog standard high density floppy drive to read or write up to 128 megabytes of data. That's the equivalent of around 100 of these. And in this video I'm going to take a look at it and see what it's all about. I'm Reese, and welcome to another episode of Control Alt Reese. But first, for reasons that will become apparent very shortly, I feel we should talk about Toshiba's Smart Media Card, a flash memory format released in 1995. Right from the off we can see that the design of the card, with the placement of the label and notched corner, was heavily inspired by the old floppy disk media that it was intended to replace. A smart marketing move on Toshiba's part, if you pardon the pun. Indeed, the Smart Media Card was originally called SSFDC, standing for Solid State Floppy Disk Card. But how is this relevant? Well, the Smart Media Card and this FlashPath floppy adapter go hand in hand as it happens, as it's this media format that the FlashPath uses internally to store its data, nicely bringing the concept of the floppy disk replacement full circle. And this was indeed a viable way to move files around in the mid to late 90s, bearing in mind that CD burners and their media were still very expensive and slow at this point, and that USB flash drives wouldn't come onto the market until 1999. The cards themselves were built around a single NAND flash chip with no onboard controller to keep costs down and were capable of speeds of up to 2 megabits per second, more than enough to saturate the first generation of low speed USB ports that maxed out at 1.5, which had started to appear in early 1996. But USB was exotic new technology and still a rare luxury to most people in 96 and wouldn't start to see mass adoption until version 1.1 came around in late 98. Dedicated card readers, where they were available, were expensive, and so those trailblazing early smart media adopters, mainly early digital camera users, would have read from the cards using their camera's built-in serial interface at a maximum of 115 kilobits per second. As it happens, the FlashPath floppy disk adapter compares very favourably, with a common high-density floppy controller running at over four times that speed at 500 kilobits per second. And of course, the FlashPath adapter isn't subject to the seek times that led to floppy usage being much slower in reality. So to test this thing out I'm going to need some files, and as the main use case for the FlashPath was indeed digital cameras, I decided to splash out on this Olympus D380 from Smart Media's peak in 2002, when it was used by around half of the digital cameras on the market. Anyway, enough talk, let's get some pictures. So now we have a card full of images, we just need to transfer them to the PC using the flash path, and that means installing some drivers. It's compatible with Windows 9X and NT, and Mac OS 9. Incidentally, a year after this was released, Apple would release the iMac, which actually did away with the floppy drive completely, a move that was seen as pretty controversial at the time. It's also interesting to note that while the Windows version offered full read and write access, the Mac version was read only. I actually managed to track down a more up-to-date version of the Windows drivers. It seems the last version released was 3.0.7. I'll put a link to download that down in the description. So now it's just a case of inserting the card into the disk and the disk into the drive and... Oh, um, evidently that's not working. Now, of course, flash memory needs to be powered to work, and standard floppy drives have no way of providing that power. There were actually two different voltages for smart media, the original being 5 volts, which is what I have here, and later on a 3.3 volt standard was introduced, although it was pretty short lived and was only really used by Apple for their quick take digital cameras. Devices could determine the voltage of the card and restrict the use of incompatible cards using the location of the notch on the corner, although it's probably important to point out that early 5 volt devices can fry the 3.3 volt cards, so be careful if you have a device that uses those. As it happens, this flash path supports both voltages, so we're safe either way. But of course, we're not going to get any voltage at all if the batteries are dead, so I'll change these CR2016s, which are more than likely 20 odd years old, for some fresh ones. 
So, time to try again and, well, at least we're getting a flash path error this time. It says to check the smart media card and, oh, seems like it's actually possible to insert it the wrong way up. Nice design. Anyway, here we go, and as you can see, there's a little icon in the system tray that tells us the adapter is up and running, and we can browse the files just like any other floppy disk. So let's copy our photos over to the hard drive. One thing that is a bit eerie is that the floppy drive is completely silent copying files. There's no need for the drive head to move, and in fact, no moving parts at all. I appreciate that the fans are pretty loud in this machine, what with it being a Pentium 4 and all, but even so, it's definitely weird. The transfer takes 4 minutes and 15 seconds, which seems painfully slow for what turns out to be 8.4 megabytes worth of data. As a basis for comparison, I thought I'd try out USB, as this later camera and PC do support it, and that involved tracking down proprietary drivers. As is quite common for these early devices, it doesn't connect as a mass storage device. Thankfully, Olympus's Canadian website still happens to be mostly stuck in the early 2000s, and although the download link had fallen victim to bit rot, I did manage to rescue the file from the Wayback Machine, and of course, I'll also link that down below. So, where were we? Oh yes, transfer speeds. So, our 8.4 megabytes of files took 4 minutes 15 to transfer using the flash path. While using USB, admittedly on a camera and machine that date to around 4 years later, the same transfer takes 14 seconds. Progress! To browse these photos, I thought I'd go for a suitably old-school solution and install PaintShop Pro 7, an absolutely essential piece of software for any retro PC. And now we can browse the files and see what they actually look like. As for the quality of the pictures? Well, they're surprisingly good actually for a 20-year-old camera, particularly the outdoor ones, and it just goes to show that the whole workflow actually works very well. Of course, with the cards being both readable and writable on a Windows PC, the flash path would have actually been a perfectly usable solution for moving all sorts of other files around as well. Certainly a lot more convenient than floppy disks, and a lot cheaper than CDRs. It's a shame a DOS driver, or indeed a solution for other floppy-based systems, was never released, but it's still a cool thing to play with. Although I should point out that it's actually not possible to format the cards in a computer using this solution, and Smart Media doesn't support any kind of automatic wear levelling for its flash memory, so just a couple of things to bear in mind. It's also interesting to note, and I had no idea where to fit this in within the narrative of the video, so I'll just shoehorn it in here, that Smart Media also supported hardware DRM, and this was actually used in Samsung's Yep MP3 players for commercial music releases, as well as in the Game Park GP32 handheld for games. But I guess that's a story for another time. So, what became of the flash path, and indeed Smart Media as a format? Well, recordable CD drives and media were coming down massively in price around the turn of the century, god that phrase makes me feel old, and USB flash drives came about at the same time and really took off as USB started to become more ubiquitous. The last smart media devices were manufactured in 2006, and although 256 megabyte cards were planned, the world had moved on by that point and so they were never released. Also, adding the extra flash chips to the cards to reach that capacity would have broken compatibility with older devices, due to the fact that the flash controller was something that had to be implemented on a device-by-device -device basis. I should add that there were MMC and Sony memory stick versions of these, which were released later on as well. Uh, I do actually have an MMC version here, but of course they all eventually met the same fate, and nowadays all of those incompatible standards are largely behind us, and SD, or Secure Digital, is pretty much the universal standard for removable flash storage. And I do think that's a good thing. I'd like to thank Rich, a patron, long-term supporter of the channel, and a good friend, for introducing me to this and allowing me to get my hands on it to try out. His name, along with all of my other lovely patrons, is on screen as I speak, and if you'd like to join them, there's a link down in the description as always. So finally, all that's left is to thank you for watching, and I'll hopefully see you again next time.